Good day, everybody, and welcome. My name is Charles Chamberlain. I manage growth and development at Dealer Services for the Family Trader. Very happy that everybody join us today for uh, this big event. We have a lot of stuff coming your way. Great insights if you want to sell more vehicles. Matthew, do you share your screen with us? Oh, I will. Just give me a sec. Sorry. No problem. People coming in. That's great. We're going to give time to join with us. Welcome to the big show, everybody. My name is Charles Chamberlain again. I'll be your host with our presenters coming right up. A lot of insights. It's all about helping you sell more vehicles. We have great presenters, like I mentioned today. We're going to have coming up Connor, Ivan. But to start, here's our host, Matthew Groden. And Matthew's got a very digital background indeed. He is at the lead at Google Canada Auto Retail team. Prior to Google, he accumulated over 20 years of digital experience with companies like Indigo Books, Music Freedom, Mobile, Hot or Not. What he loves to do, Matthew, is spend his time helping dealers better understand the digital ecosystem, collaborate with OEMs, agencies also, and Google partners. And at the end of the day, like I said, everybody, to sell more vehicles. So without further ado, the mic goes to Matthew. Thanks, Charles. <clears throat> we still have people coming in here. So if there's delays between the slides, it's because I'm admitting people into the presentation. <laughs> so that's, that's a good thing. That's a good it's thing. A good thing. So I apologize for that in advance. There we go. Um, hey, everyone. So thank you again for coming. Um, it's, it's fair to say, uh, I don't know when to shut up is really the, the thing that I will, uh, I will fill all of the available airtime that I can. Um, but, uh, and I also have this issue where I keep editing this presentation. And so even if you've seen it before, I can guarantee you there's something new in here that you have not seen previously, um, because I know I added six new slides this morning. I try to delete things, but I can't. I can't find a lot of things to delete. But uh, for those of you who know me or have seen me present before, uh, you may remember some things about me. I almost always open presentations like this with the same little factoids. The first being that I grew up in a small town, uh, the small town of Wyerton. Uh, Wyerton famous, of course, for its uh, albino groundhog, right? Which, you know, usually half of any room is like, oh, of course, Wyerton, home of the groundhog. And the other half is like, what are you talking about? So I just kind of leave that at that. You can Google Wyerton later and find out about our esteemed Groundhog prognosticator. Uh, I have been at Google for now over six years, uh, all that time in the, the auto team for the last two years working this uh, auto retail desk, uh, working more closely with, with dealers and auto groups, and working across brands. Uh, but before that, yes, as Charles said, uh, I, I am a bit of a great white buffalo in that I've worked my entire career in digital for, for more than 25 years. Uh, but it, along the way, and I guess it was about my third job out of university, I worked for a not-for-profit organization that focused solely on the employment of persons with disabilities. And at that job, uh, one of the things that I kind of accidentally became was uh, an advocate for for web accessibility and so if you don't know what web accessibility is or what accessible web design means it was fundamentally or the easiest way to to think about it is how would you build a website for people who cannot see it right it's a, an entirely different design challenge than the way we normally think about our websites uh, and that was really not the end of our our advocacy we also spent a lot of time myself and the executive director of our organization, trying to uh, affect change at a, a municipal, provincial, and federal level in building codes. Because we assumed that if we could change things at the building code level, if we could ensure that accessible design was applied to, to building codes, that it would just be easier for people in general, right? That would solve a lot of mobility-related and, and visual-related disability issues people have just getting 
to and from work. And so if we could address it at the, at the building code level, uh, and similarly at the web, you know, guideline level, then we could address a lot of these issues in, in one foul swoop. And so to that end, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about curb cuts. So curb cuts, we kind of take for granted now. They're kind of everywhere. Pretty much every municipality in the country has, has adopted this as a standard, uh, no matter where you are. Um, but 20 years ago, that just wasn't the case. Like that just, they didn't exist. They weren't in building codes, even here in Toronto where I am. It didn't formally become part of municipal building code uh, until maybe 2013 and didn't really come into effect until 2015. Uh, but now they're everywhere and we we take them, we kind of take them for granted. But the the thing about a curb cut is that it, although yes, it was originally intended to make it easier for people in a wheelchair or anyone with a, any kind of mobility disability to get over the curb more easily, uh, it really had this kind of secondary impact. And that secondary impact is what people affectionately refer to as, sorry, there is a great podcast on this topic if you want to do some more research on it. So there's 99% Invisible Curb Cut podcast in case you want to. But it's really this notion of the curb cut effect, right? So that if you remove the largest barriers to anything, you will make it easier for everyone right so and in this sense and you look at the photo in the background here it's really you know having this curb cut made this easier for you know the kid on the skateboard as well as the parent pushing the stroller as well as just people walking right if you have if you've ever had a sore knee and had issues trying to lift your leg up over a curb then you know what i'm talking about so uh as we we think about this you know how does it relate to car buying well really car buying hasn't gotten any easier right it's still mostly all the same steps yes we've we've begun digitizing some of those steps uh, but the act is still very complex still many things have to happen and so what i want to challenge all of you today with is this thought of if you're going to take this notion of removing barriers right removing barriers for the the exercise of making things easier easier in your dealership for people to buy a vehicle how would you layer the curb cut into your day-to-day -day operation how would you layer like the curb cut effect into your day-to-day -day operation so just kind of lodge that thought that notion straight into the back of your brain while we go through this entire presentation and i want to talk about kind of three macro trends. Uh, the first macro trend uh, is really just everything goes digital. And we can see that even in this presentation, the fact that I didn't do a physical think dealer presentation that I'm working with, you know, my partners, my auto groups, my agency partners, uh, as well as OEMs to, to get this content out into the field and haven't been on a plane in over a year. In fact, my last flight so i was in a meeting and people were we were doing like an icebreaker and was like when was the last time you were on a plane and where was that to and from and the last time i was on a plane was coming home from edmonton um uh, last year after dealer huddle and and it's been more than a year since but so everything goes a little bit more digital why do i say that i'm like well we can't we're not you know we're not doing physical things right now and so this data here is from the google mobility reports uh, it's updated weekly. You could Google it. You could find it yourself. Um, I have been tracking this over time. It has shifted pretty dramatically from last fall until today in different ways. Uh, there's some consistent things in it. And the consistent things are we're really avoiding transit stations, right? We're avoiding public transit and commuter trains. Um, workplaces uh, have been up and down a bit, but always in that kind of negative 30 to negative 40% range. Uh, recreational retail, again, depending on the state of openness in your province very different uh, grocery and pharmacy have have come up and down but even now we're avoiding extra trips to the grocery store and trying to do a lot of bulk shopping uh, parks has been interesting to watch because last fall parks was huge it was up like 50 percent because when we could get outside that's where we wanted to go we wanted to go we wanted to go to parks, so we did that. But right now, we're not going to parks as much. And in fact, this number is higher than a month ago, obviously, in, in January, uh, people not heading to parks. But maybe now weather's getting better and, and we are going back to parks. So the only place that Canadians are going to and from with any kind of regularity right now is retail, or sorry, is, is residential destinations. We're going maybe to, to visit friends and family or just to our own homes. 
And this slide, this particular quote, I had it in a bunch of presentations last year and then I dropped it for about eight months and now I'm bringing it back because I still feel like it, it encapsulates um, my own personal thought on my life right now and probably you have a, a similar POV, but really this quote from Bernard Marr, who is a, an author and futurist, um, often public speaker, he said, if necessity is the mother of invention, then coronavirus forced many around the world to rethink our daily lives from work to school to entertainment. And in response, many people turned to digital tools to maintain some semblance of normality. And you can kind of, you probably feel that in your own experience, uh, having virtual pints, having virtual, I mean, I've had everything from virtual parties to virtual funerals uh, on on webcam. It's It's been strange, right? It's been a strange year. Uh, we probably all bought something online that we didn't buy before. And I often talk about probably too much. My neighbors say, too much uh, about the fact that I can now get beer delivered to my house, uh, which I couldn't do pre-pandemic. It took a pandemic for us to figure out alcohol delivery to the home. But I, I Googled this and I looked for this. I've used this data in other presentations, but now it's actually right there in SERPs. You don't have to go far. If you wanted to run this search yourself, you would see the same graph. You look at the overall internet penetration within Canada, among Canadians, and you see that basically 91% of the population has access to the internet. And that was of 2019 from, from the World Bank. Uh, they do an international telecommunications survey. And so this data is a little stale. So it's probably higher than it was even then. But as you can see, what I always like to point out is that we are higher in terms of overall internet penetration and use than the United States and our Aussie, Aussie, you know, Friends. So, and it's, you can just run the search and see this for yourself. He, just a, a few months back, uh, the federal government promised to connect 98% of Canadians to high speed internet. So, there already is, uh, you know, coverage that's uh, higher than 91%, but uh, federal government putting together this, what they call the Universal Broadband Fund, to actually close the next six or 7% of that to make sure that high speed internet is available everywhere, no matter where you are in the country. And that's really in response to the fact that we're all spending that much more time online due to the pandemic. This quote from John Stackhouse from the Royal Bank, he said, the Canadian companies need to move at warp speed into a digitally enabled global economy. That means investing in tools and technology, but it also means adopting and developing skills and mindsets that we need to thrive in a digital economy, one in which anyone anywhere can be your customer, and at the same time, anyone anywhere can be your competitor. Shouldn't be a surprise then, right? Straight out of Google's Think Auto research gear shift data from last year, 90% of car buyers relied on online research across six different digital touch points, right? What were the top touch points that so was really search, online video, the OEM site, the dealer site, and then review and comparison sites. But there is a real world component to this. And so the top offline sources were a dealership visit, a test drive, family and friends, a phone call with a dealer and car experts. And then squarely at the bottom of this list on, on either axis was really radio print and sponsorships. Sorry, just admitting people, uh, there we go. Uh, this data from Stats Canada, uh, a clear depiction of how Canadian shopping behavior has changed as a result of COVID-19. So overall retail is up online nearly 95%. Uh, and again, it goes to say we've all been probably buying things, buying something that we had never bought online before. I also often talk about the fact that I now have a subscription to toilet paper on Amazon Prime. But uh, some of these categories are things you wouldn't have expected, right? Things that were previously thought uh, very difficult to buy online or uh, we weren't as keen or interested like clothing, which is now up 83% year over year, or even building and garden supplies, right? Where we would have, you know, taken the opportunity to get out to Home Depot or Rona or where, Home Hardware or wherever to get those supplies. Uh, we're now quite comfortable buying pretty much anything online. But when we compare that to automotive, when we kind of take that lens of where are we at with this whole notion of buying cars online, 
e-commerce, digital retail? Well, a few different data points, right? So in 2019, when I was still out in the world presenting Think Dealer data, uh, that survey said that 43, <laughs> survey says 43% of car buyers said they were likely or very likely to consider purchasing a vehicle online. And last year, we clocked in about maybe in 2020, 2% of vehicles were actually sold digitally. Now, miracle of small numbers, that's up 100%. Uh, so we went from 1% in 2019 to 2% in 2020. Yet interest in buying a car online was much higher, right? And we, we kind of measured this throughout the year and it actually was higher at the height of the first wave of the pandemic. But where we landed after the country opened up in the summer was that about 59% of Canadians said there was you know, they would buy a vehicle online if that capability was available. And what I like to point out, usually at this point in the presentation, is that other omni-channel retail businesses like a Best Buy or a Walmart only see about 20% of their sales come through digital channels, right? So they, they still see the majority of purchases happening in store, uh, much like automotive, the bulk of the research happens digitally, but about 20% of sales happen for omni omni channel retailers digitally. And yet, you know, I was I was part of a panel uh, in a podcast a few weeks back, and one of the folk, one of the other folk in the panel was from one of the auction houses for used inventory, and he made a really interesting point. And he said that prior to the pandemic, you know, half of the used vehicles they were selling. Uh, were sold online to dealers. And yet that since the beginning of the pandemic, that that had gone from 50% to 100%, that dealers buy their inventory online. They buy from either the OEM or from an auction house or other sources digitally. And yet they don't offer that to the consumer. It's sort of like, well, of course I buy my vehicles online, but no one else does, right? No human would do this, which I think is a really interesting juxtaposition, a really interesting you know, problem in our current ecosystem in that there's a lot of belief in the capability to buy the inventory and bring it to the dealership and less faith in the belief that a consumer would do the same thing. Sorry, just admitting. Right. Uh, but then let's let's talk to our friend Jeff. Jeff, who here I call former CEO, right? He's retiring. It's uh, another gentleman who's taking over Amazon. So Jeff is now just a wealthy dude, probably relaxing somewhere in California. Um, the hardest parts of e-commerce are not the website, right? Are not the actual experience per se uh, that you see digitally. It's all of the other experience parts. It's all, it's customer service, it's logistics, it's delivery, it's returns, right? Those are the hard parts of e-commerce. So he has been quoted as saying, if you make customers unhappy in the physical world, they might tell six friends, if you make customers unhappy on the internet, they can tell 6,000 friends, you know, through social media, through forums, uh, through email and the like. So let's lodge that in the back of our heads, that the hard parts of this are really the processes and the back end and back office parts uh, that make sure that the vehicle actually ends up in the customer's hands, that what we're saying is actually available and in stock is what we're actually making available for sale on our websites. The other trend I want to talk about is this notion of the new new car buyer. Uh, this is a different piece of global research that uh, we've put together. Uh, I will remind everyone, and again, we hit this pretty hard uh, as a talking point a couple of years ago. I'm not going to talk about it much today, but that millennials grew up, that 40% of car buyers, vehicle buyers are now millennials. They uh, This has come to pass. It was actually 2021 when they emerged as the largest buying population. Sorry, it was 2020 that they emerged as the largest buying population for anything. Uh, and now we're in 2021. So 40% of all vehicle buyers are, are millennial and they're younger and they have slightly different needs. Uh, public transit, massive declines across the globe and again up and down depending on the the state of the pandemic in different parts of the country and, and around the globe but uh, at its height uh, global public use dropped 90 percent here in toronto i know the ttc said it went down 85 percent uh, and then kind of got back to normal and then has has dropped again rideshare also experiencing some pretty 
pretty uh, massive declines. Uber experienced a $1.9 billion loss uh, during the first quarter of the pandemic. Uh, but then they picked up some of that revenue, not as much, frankly. They didn't, it wasn't a full offset uh, by delivering food through Uber Eats or just Uber Freight, just people delivering things to people in Ubers. So who is this new, new car buyer? Well, then they are really, they are younger, they are more urban, and they are more interested in electric vehicles. These are people who didn't have vehicles before, who are like, I now don't want to be on public transit. I previously relied to a degree in ride share and car sharing, and now I don't have those means at my disposal, and so I probably need a new vehicle. So they're 3.3 times more likely to fall into that, you know, Gen Y, Gen Z demographic of 18 to 34. They're 1.1 times more likely to live in an urban center. So call that Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, you know, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal, Halifax. Uh, they are 1.5 times more likely to start from a place of considering an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid, but that may not be where they land. Uh, we had both a survey in this piece of research and uh, we spoke to some of the folk that we that were in the survey directly. The one thing that all of the folk we spoke to directly said was, I am not a car person. So this audience is completely influenceable, meaning we can either you know, influence their decision through through media, communications, marketing, or we can, you know, probably influence them at dealership when they come in and they're actually looking for that first vehicle. Uh, because they're younger and they know less, uh, they use more online sources to get a different perspective. And so this quote here, I think, is kind of tells the story. I want to be well informed, but don't want to have to put a ton of time in understanding if this is an unbiased source that I can trust. I like to read overviews from a few different sources and then use forums to understand and experience the experience of having the car vehicle and then watch some shorter form video of the car I'm interested in, but I will also talk to my friends and hear their perspectives. And so they're, they are a little more digitally inclined. They use basically the same sources, but in perhaps a slightly different order with OEM website first, then search, then the, the dealer website, but they're also one and a half times more likely to turn to YouTube in the research process. Every step for this new, new car buyer skews a little bit more digital. So there are three times more likely to be completely open to purchasing the vehicle entirely online. Yet they also acknowledge that there's uh, a real world component to this, that they either will, you know, physically receive the vehicle in their driveway or in front of the garage, or they have to go to the dealership to get it. And so they're thinking about that as an event. Like they know that this is a, 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 a kind of, material life event. And again, this quote, I think, sums it up. When I go to buy my new car, I would be dressed up nicely, very presentable. I would definitely be excited. Buying a car is such a celebratory event. So they know that this isn't something that entirely happens digitally, but they also would do more of it digitally if they could. Uh, third trend here, really increased demand. Uh, so this is you know a combination of all of those same factors and where do I why do I say this well we saw in our survey data that one of the other and we were able to kind of collect data um, in the heart of the first wave and then shortly thereafter and so we were able to ask people you know what do you expect now like what are you expecting now that we live in this kind of you know COVID world or post first wave world and fundamentally what people said they're like well I I'm expecting some enhanced online communication, whatever that is. I'm looking for more online purchase options. Uh, I'm expecting vehicle delivery, car delivery for both test drives and for service. Uh, I'm expecting lower prices. I often point out, I don't know where they're expecting that from or why they expect that, but they're expecting lower prices. But there's also this whole new notion or a turn to a notion of more interest in personal vehicle ownership. Right, that there's because of these other factors, people are like, okay, I might have relied on rideshare before, but now I actually need a vehicle of my own. Or I may have had only one vehicle in my family and now I need to add that second vehicle to, to my family. And then the last piece here, uh, some notion of establishing purely online dealerships, which probably goes hand in hand with that more online purchase options. Also, 
at Google, we can see this in the query trends for the last year, and it, it follows closely, you know, the on one side, the wave of the pandemic. So you can see last year at the beginning of 2020, uh, we were pretty flat year over year. So we were basically, you know, neck and neck with 2019. And then we, we hit the first wave there in March and queries dropped. Uh, and yet it was still higher. Like the drop off is not as severe as you might have thought. So there was some group of people who knew they needed a new vehicle and continued searching. And the return in terms of overall queries was was pretty quick. We were back to the same level as 2019 and then exceeded 2019 by May. And then by June, we were, you know, handsomely exceeding 2019 queries. And we ended the entire year last year up about 12% year over year, uh, which itself was high. And if you look at where we're at right now uh, for these kind of last two months, January and February 2021, we're actually up almost 18%. That as soon as you know, I believe as soon as we are out of lockdown in most of the country again and things start to return to normal as the, you know, we get through this second wave, I think we'll see a similar pattern to what happened last year with all that pent up demand that came out in kind of, you know, Q, late Q2, early Q3 uh, in, in June, July, August, September last year. I think we're going to see a bit of a, a similar rush to purchase vehicles once people are able able to do that. But if you don't believe me, if the query trend isn't enough to make you believe that, then don't believe me. Believe uh, Automotive News Canada because they also had research and frankly, I believe the much of the research they cited in this article that the pandemic created demand for new and used vehicle study finds. Uh, I believe the study was actually done by, by our friends at Autotrader. So there you have it. Uh, what else did we learn about the buying journey? Well, a few things, reinforced some things we already knew and then highlighted uh, the importance of some things. So first we, again, that the exercise of buying a vehicle is really an exercise in getting answers to key questions, right? So as I go through all of the steps, uh, whether I'm answering those questions myself or I'm expecting to get that answer from the OEM or the dealer you know, website or in real communication, really trying to figure out and answer some core questions. And those core questions are all related to, you know, what should I buy? You know, so I'm comparing vehicles. I'm I'm using configurators like build and price tools to, to see what model and trim I should buy. And I'm trying to get all of this information quickly. So it's, it's about narrowing in on make model trim and trying to get the answer quickly. And then the other focal point, the other kind of dark green dot on this slide is really that I'm really trying to find the best price. It's all about the vehicle I want and the best price. And we'll see that echoed in a couple more places in a few more slides. Also, most vehicle discovery happens online. So we're, you know, question here, how did you discover the vehicle you most recently bought? Well, 77% for you, 71% from for new. First product discovery was online, where are the places people are finding that? Uh, dealership websites, OEM websites, and then on review and comparison sites. Uh, brands considered, this story has not changed much over the years, but this is, many of these slides are like new views with um, sort of exposing more of the data and showing both the new and the used side together. But people basically start with three brands, four maybe on the used side, and then as they narrow in on what they actually want to buy and who they actually want to buy it from, that drops down to one or two brands, right? One or two vehicles. So I start out a little broad and then by the time I get to the bottom, I'm like, I've got, I've got it narrowed in on it's this vehicle or it's this vehicle and, you know, the safety school, my backup vehicle, the other vehicle. The other data that we kind of have talked about for years and we're kind of sharing in a very different format, I believe this year uh, and last year during Think Auto, during the actual video presentation, I quoted Eminem and I said, you know, you've only got one shot at this, right, straight out of the eight mile. And we've been using in the past an average of dealership visits and saying things like, oh, on average, consumers visit two and a half dealerships or two or 1.7, right? It's kind of been up and down and it's different by OEM and by segment. When you look at it like this, what you can see is the vast majority of people are only going to one dealership. So the question here was how many different dealership locations did you visit prior to purchasing? And so 72% for new and 61 for used, only going to one store, 
only go on to one dealership. And then some people, and again, if, it's the, if I had more than one vehicle in mind, if I hadn't narrowed in on a specific vehicle, or if something happened in that first dealership visit, then I'm going to dealership two, three, four, and God forbid, dealership five, because that feels like a lot of places to go to buy your vehicle. Although that's kind of what happened with me and some furniture that my wife and I bought, but that's a whole other story. Um, consumer, really, and a couple of years ago, I actually did a he said, she said, like, what, what do dealers believe? What do consumers believe? But this is the, the consumer side of the story. Um, why, what are they influenced by? What helps them decide what dealership to actually buy from? And number one, it's, it's in stock. The vehicle I was looking for was available and or it was at the right price, right? So it's availability at the right price. And then after that, it's, uh, I had a good experience with this dealership before. And then after that, it's, uh, this dealership is a reasonable distance from my home or work. It's, it's a reasonable distance from my regular, you know, commute from my own universe. So like at the beginning, right, where we were saying it's, you know, the consumer is trying to get answers to questions. And the first question is, what am I actually going to buy? And the the punchline to that question is, is it in stock? And then the other place, the other focal point was really narrowing in on the right price. It's also how they're deciding what dealer to actually buy from. How do people actually contact a dealership? So the question here, which, if any, of the following ways, did you contact a dealership or car lot? Uh, so they may have used more than one, but uh, the vast majority of people just walking in, right? And this kind of mirrors that only one store notion. They're only going to one dealership if they have to, which means they're doing all of that research digitally up front to kind of self-diagnose, to kind of self-inform, what do I want to buy? And then they are going straight in for the kill. Uh, then some after walk-ins, right? It's phone at 33 and 40% respectively, then email and text. Then the online web form are very, are hyper focus from a dealership media perspective, but it's web form, then online chat, and then social media. You know, really should have a second person here just to let people into the meeting. But uh, so if we're in a state of lockdown and people can't just walk in, right, then, then what do we do? And what do we do? So this question I would ask you, put this in the back of your head while we go through the next set of slides, right? What are, what are the options in terms of supporting people uh, when they can't actually come into your dealership. So this section I refer to as the notes from the field. It's something I started to do a couple of years ago where I take questions that dealers have asked me and then I provide the answer that I give uh, and then provide some supplemental uh, information, which is a phenomena a uh, former colleague of mine, not from Google, from a previous job, uh, used to refer to as answers to questions you didn't even ask. But uh, here we go. Questions. Questions that dealers ask. So how do I know if my agency is doing a good job, right? Which is a question uh, that myself and my colleagues get a lot, which I, you know, is really a euphemism for what I often actually hear from a dealer, which comes out more like, should I fire my agency? And it's more like, should I fire? Is my agency doing a good job? Should I fire them? Asks a dealer in a meeting. And so for a long time, it, we didn't at Google have a great answer for this. There wasn't really an objective way for you to look at your account and say, uh, they are not doing a good job, you should, you should fire them. But now there kind of is an objective way and that objective way is really optimization scores. So this came out um, a little over a year ago, um, originally only available for search, now available for search and display. Uh, will soon also include video product in Mountain View. has been talking about that for a while, hasn't happened yet, but I expect it will happen here in 2021 at some point. Um, it is a score. Optimization score is a score between zero and 100. Uh, it looks at all the things that are going on in your Google Ads account, and then it makes a calculation, a determination on what is the health of that account. It's instant, so it's up to date the moment you go into the account and see this. Uh, it's personalized to the structure of your account. So if you have set up campaigns with the goal of getting more leads, of getting more website traffic, of driving more phone calls, then it will fashion both the recommendations uh, and the score around those goals. And so it's personalized to your own account. And then it provides within the recommendations section here uh, some to-dos, things that you could do, recommendations which would save you time and get you more of what you want, right? How do you optimize your account to get more 
of what you want. It, the overall score is broken up into these five areas, so it does include uh, bids and budgets. So are you bidding the right amount? Is your overall budget enough to cover the keywords that you're bidding on uh, based on the bids that you've given? Should you decrease bids? on some keywords, are you overspending? Um, ads and extensions, so the overall creative, is it built the way we think it should be? Have you met all of the standards that we apply to both search and display creative? Repairs, just things that are broken, so are there negative keywords you need to apply? Uh, is there any kind of policy violation that needs your attention to get that fixed? Uh, keywords and targeting, so are you using the right keywords? Are there keywords you can add? Are there negatives you could apply to gain some efficiency? Are you using all the audience signals you could apply to, to your campaigns or are there more? And then automation, right? So are you using our smart bidding strategies and are you applying and using all of our new automated campaign types. Then often what happens is I share that information and then, um, and this is a true story from a dealer that, that did this in a dealer 20 meeting about a year ago, I shared that information and uh, they, you know, on their phone, they do, 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 emailed their agency, they're like, hey, what's my optimization score? And then the reply came back and they're like, we don't believe in Google's recommendations and we don't think optimization score is the right measure. And you know, the punchline there was that dealer's optimization score was in the 50s. So they didn't want to share that information for some obvious reasons. But uh, the, the dealer spoke up once he got the email about 20 minutes later in the meeting and said, you know, is this true? Is this true, Matthew, that some of the recommendations aren't valid? And I said, yeah, man, like the Google Ads isn't just built for automotive. It's built for every vertical. And there are things in there that don't make sense for a dealer. So where I point out in Google Ads, support uh, is an area where it says, uh, you know your products and your goals best if there's a recommendation that doesn't seem relevant for your ad campaign or you're appropriate for your advertising goals, then just dismiss it, right? Just dismiss it. Now, annoyingly, it is true, things come back. So if you go in, say, and you update your account with this month's offers and ad creative, um, you will reset this. And because it is done in real time, it may recommend the same thing that you didn't do last month again, uh, but it does get smarter over time. And if you dismiss the recommendations, eventually they, they go away for longer periods of time. Uh, am I bidding on the right keywords? Ooh, classic, classic dealer question, which is really code, I believe, for the, and what dealers often say is, should I bid on my own dealership name? Should I bid on my own dealership name? And the answer to that question is really, that depends. And that's also not the way we would discuss it. We would discuss it like this. We're like, you know, you should bid on the keywords that are achieving your business goals. And so are there dealers in parts of the country where they could probably get away with not bidding on their own brand name and still be very efficient and still drive more leads and traffic to their website? Absolutely. Uh, but if you are a dealer in a hyper competitive market, uh, you probably don't want to leave your brand terms undefended, right? You, there's probably good reason for you to be bidding on your own brand terms, but I always recommend you set that up as a separate campaign and you manage that budget very discreetly to control, to make sure that you're not overspending on that campaign. Um, but the other way that we really talk about this is not about, yeah, you must, yes, bid on that. No, is really just the, is it working? Are you getting the goals you know, are you achieving the goals that you you were actually setting forth? And are you covering the keywords that you're bidding on um, well? And are you addressing it through this lens of the key buying moments that are relevant to the car shopper? So again, if buy a car is getting answers to questions, then using search is really when people are asking those questions. They may not always add the what is or what or why or where to the to the query, but effectively what they're asking is things like, you know, can I afford it? Where should I buy it? And am I getting a good deal? And those are the types of questions we would encourage a dealer to, to lean into in terms of the keywords that are selected and the things that they would bid on in Google search. So that's really stuff related to pricing and financing, uh, the dealership and your nameplates and geography, as well as deals and incentives. Uh, but also that whole question is really centered around um, backhandedly, I would say, a, can I get away with just leaving that up to organic search? And yeah, I, again, I, am, I would believe that if you looked at Google Analytics, you will see the vast majority of your traffic comes from either Google paid and or Google organic search. And so um, there is certainly good traffic to be had there. However, there are things that you can do in a search ad you just cannot do 
in organic search. And that's, you know, move quickly, right? So organic search takes a long time uh, to index. And so your the information there may not be as current as what is in an ad. Uh, so if you need to promote something quickly, if you want to get the word out about an offer, a nameplate, your dealership quickly, you probably need to do that in an ad. If you want to include very dynamic content that changes all the time, like your inventory, your pricing, and your offers, then you probably need to do that in a search ad creative. And there's a bunch of different ways to skin that cat. It's also how you can add clearer calls to action through adding extensions through, you know, the use of things like um, the phone phone extensions and location extensions and uh, responsive search ads. You get to control the message and who sees it in, in search ads where you can't really do that in organic. And as I mentioned, you can fend off your competition and ultimately get more leads. And I have yet to meet a dealer who said to me, no, I'm good. I don't need any more. I don't need any more leads. I'm all full up here. Uh, if you are looking for new keywords to bid on, though, there are kind of a couple of places I would point you to look for that. And the first is really we've built out this tool. It's been there a while, right in Google Ads called Keyword Planner. And you can drop in, you know, your brand, your dealership name, your website, or your OEM's website and brand and nameplates, uh, as well as your competitors, because you can just sort of explore what are what are the keywords you could be bidding on. It'll make a whole slew of recommendations related to that. Uh, it'll give you, you know, the notion of how competitive is that keyword relative to the structure of your account in your marketing area. Right. So if you've set up your PMA, then it'll say like this is hyper competitive keyword or this is a low competition keyword. It'll give you a sense of, you know, the overall available impressions and then give you a bit of a sense of the high and the low end of what you might have to bid to, to win some of those auctions to actually land some of that traffic from those keywords. The other area that I would recommend you spend a little time in, you may not be looking there, and most often I find people are not using this to find new keywords, uh, is really the insights area in Google My Business. So right in Google My Business, there is this area that has a full build out of all the keywords that rendered your business profile in Google search. And that's valuable because uh, Google Ads is only a representation of the ads universe. Google Analytics is only a view of the people who actually showed up on your website, uh, where here you're going to have a combination of both the organic and the paid queries, as well as the queries that rendered your profile where no one even went to your website where people uh, may have just gotten the information they needed from Google My Business. So if they only needed your phone number or your hours, if the you know if that information was up to date and is there right in Google My Business, then they may not have even clicked over to your website. So this is the only place where you get to see all three keyword combinations in one place. And we break it down into direct queries, discovery queries, and, and branded queries. So this is often a very powerful add-on tool that you can leverage to mine for more, more keyword ideas. But while we're on the topic of search, uh, a few other things. So search has evolved uh, thanks to machine learning. I often, I don't know how many times a day or a week, well, maybe only once a day, but today I'm gonna say it a few times. Uh, we say this phrase like, oh, we leverage machine learning to blah, blah, blah. And so machine learning uh, really through uh, a capability we, we have that's called, and other people of machine learning have this too, called natural language processing. We have a much better sense of, you know, what people are searching for, how they search, phrases, phrase match. And so that has changed uh, many aspects of the back end of Google Ads, including, you know, uh, being layered into smart bidding. It's fundamental to dynamic search ads and responsive search ads uh, are our capability to optimize creative uh, within an ad group. It's how we do data-driven attribution, and it's how we decide what extensions we're actually going to serve on an ad when an ad is shown. A couple of things you might not have noticed or seen, but this was uh, something we we published just a couple of weeks ago, but we're making some changes to match types. We're actually collapsing two match types, and this is very technical, so if you're not a search practitioner, this is going to may go over your head. So I apologize for that. But we're taking phrase match and broad match modifier and we're 
collapsing them into the future version of phrase match. So broad match modified will now be part of phrase match. Uh, it means, and it, it will be refined in a way, tighter in a way than broad match modifier was before. Uh, this is a slow rollout, so you may not see this fully in your own search account or search results yet, uh, but it will be coming. Um, it really just means that in a very near future, like imminently, there will be exact match, so you'll be able to control keywords you use based on exact match still. Uh, phrase match, you know, allows you to include the meaning of the keyword, so it's kind of, we can infer meaning and phraseology based on phrase match, again, using machine learning and understanding how people think, speak, and search, and then broad match, which is more, you know, things that are related to those keywords. Uh, also, and also on the same day, it was a big day, February 18th, uh, we made an announcement that the new go forward default search format, and this is something I know even some of the people on the call were asking about uh, pretty recently, uh, the go forward search format is responsive search ads. Uh, we haven't done away with the standard or what was, you know, there was standard search ads, then expanded search ads or ETAs. Now we have responsive search ads. RSAs. Uh, so ETAs haven't gone away. Uh, you can still create them, but uh, there will be an event horizon where that will go away. And now responsive search ads will be the, the format of choice going forward. And so they will be the default ad type when you create a new campaign from, from here on in. Also, uh, very exciting development right now. This is Still, before I get too excited, it's only in a limited pilot and only available right now in the US of A. Uh, after a lot of work internally um, between myself and a bunch of other people at Google, we have finally got our global product team to put together some automotive specific ad formats, and this is really the first of them, uh, called vehicle listing ads. It is the automotive equivalent to some of our shopping formats or a format if you ever worked in other verticals you might have known as product listing ads, uh, but, the, but we kind of also layered in a bit of what we call local inventory ads, just for good measure. So uh, it is a lower funnel format that will only show up for longer, more discrete queries uh, where someone is definitively showing that lower funnel intent. So, you know, if I was searching for, say, 2020, you know, blue uh, Honda Civic or, you know, 2021 F-150 Lariat white, if I, you know, I'm adding many qualifiers to my query, then instead of surfacing an RSA, uh, I might see a vehicle listing ad. So super exciting. This is a feed-based product. So it does or will uh, leverage Merchant Center in Google Ads, which is again, a, a piece of technology that's been there for a long time that wasn't really available to us in automotive, but uh, should be available to us later this year. And although it's not available in Canada yet, I hope that uh, we are able to onboard a handful of automotive accounts into this pilot um, in the next few months. So coming. Stay tuned for more. Cool. Uh, hey, if people can't come to my store, how do I sell them? Asks a sales manager during COVID-19. Yeah. And not to sound like a complete jerk, uh, and also a different question that people have been asking, like people are, I've been at a bunch of meetings and webinars and people are like, hey, Matthew, if you could tell dealers one thing that they should be doing during lockdown, what is it? And the answer is the same. And it's really just maybe answer the phone. Right, well, not exactly what you expect from the Google guy, but maybe maybe focus on your phone call processes. Maybe focus on getting more phone calls. Uh, oh, somebody is off mute. I'm going to mute them if I can figure out who that is. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, maybe answer the phone. And that has spun up a whole series of conversations, uh, but it, on the high level, if you just spend a little bit more time thinking about phone calls and how you might get more of them, uh, we do have this capability to allow you to optimize to phone call conversion. So the first step in that exercise would really be making sure you're tracking phone calls as a goal uh, in Google Analytics and, and then moving those conversions over into Google Ads so that you can see you know, what keywords and campaigns are actually driving the most value and generating phone calls for your business. And then if you were to do kind of a back of the envelope math, if you kind of took all your phone calls on one side and you took all of your 
you know, all the phone calls coming in and the media that generated them and all of the phone calls and phone numbers that ended up in your DMS and your booking system for, for service, you'd be able to maybe, well, if you had a couple of spare hours and were really loved spending time in Excel, you could probably do some back of the envelope math to say, you know, this media drove these phone calls that resulted in these sales and these ROs and here's the ROI on that. Uh, and then that would help you again, leverage our automated bid strategies to optimize your campaigns to get more phone calls. Um, so if that is something you're interested in, there is a whole methodology to this. I would say work with your marketing team or call the folk at traffic uh, to make sure that this is in place and that you're optimizing to get as many phone calls as possible. And then I would also say, you know, consider looking at launching a local campaign and I'll explain that in another slide or two. There is you know, a lot of dealers already have, and as I said, there's a much more involved methodology and process that I'm exploring to to kind of measure this and hopefully build a case study that we might talk about later this year. Uh, but if you don't have um, any third party call tracking provider, there is a low cost, a free solution that will get you part of the way there that is offered by Google Ads called Google Call Forwarding Numbers. And there's the support article, a link. I will share this deck afterwards. And so you can go check out the support article and just make sure you've got this in place if you don't already. Uh, local campaigns, in case you missed it, uh, is a whole new campaign type. Uh, it it was something that was in beta a year ago, uh, but the beta requirements were kind of stupid and really only made it available to OEMs. It was really only something that we could do at the OEM level. Quietly in the middle of last year, the product team released local campaigns into the wild. They added some new capabilities to it uh, to allow it to optimize to either store visit conversions or to what we call local actions. And those local actions are phone calls and driving direction requests. So this new campaign type, it runs across all of our largest properties. So search and maps and YouTube and the Google display network all at the same time. So you do need kind of one of everything. You need one asset of every type, a display asset, um, basically the guts of a responsive uh, search at, or a responsive search ad, a responsive display ad, and a video to actually get this up and running. So again, talk to your marketing team or talk to, to traffic about how you might get this up and running. And a case study, fairly new, hot off the press from the US, uh, local campaigns at this automotive group, Crown Auto Group in the US, uh, drove an increase in local actions and store visit conversions of plus 93%, and then a staggering increase in conversions because of all that new available inventory mostly on Google Maps, uh, a 1,572% increase in impressions. So, and that's something we're seeing pretty consistently. The impression volume is very high at a very, very low cost, uh, and it does drive incremental, you know, local actions and store visits. Cool. What is the state of digital retailing? Should I buy one of these tools? Asked a tech savvy dealer and, you know, uh, I kind of have a couple of responses to that question. The first is, you know, when I'm asked about the whole universe of digital retailing, my first thought or comment, it's definitely my first thought, if I don't say it out loud, is that I feel like we're partying like it's 1999, like it is a little bit like the Prince song, um, which means we're really at the beginning uh, of our digital retailing and e-commerce journey in automotive, much like the first wave of startup e-commerce in 1999. Uh, and some people are going to have great success and some aren't. And some OEMs are going to figure this out and some aren't. Uh, some companies are going to do well and some don't, right? So it's, it is, but it's very early days. It's still too early to call. And it's also not a question I can answer for you. Like I can't tell you to get one of these tools. I can tell you what the consumer research says. I can tell you that there's demand for it, but whether you go down this path or not is kind of up to you or possibly your, your OEM. Um, however, uh, this is, uh, so Nick here, or we call him NDG internally at Google. He's a Canadian Googler who now works in Mountain View uh, as our chief evangelist. He runs executive summits for many different types of clients. And he recently did a virtual executive summit for a Canadian OEM. And one of the things he posed to them, the question he posed to them, or sort of the challenge he posed to them was, let's not really care. Let's not focus about like what number, what percentage of cars will be sold online because that's, or should I sell online? Those aren't very useful questions. Let's think through a different question. Let's think through the, what is the consumer experience that we need 
we either build or buy that will delight customers and sell as many cars as possible online and in the showroom, right? Like what is that experience that will do that uh, in a way that helps dealers and OEMs make more money, right? Like that's, that's a much better question than what percentage of, like how do we sell more cars regardless of channel? How do we really adopt an omni-channel mi mindset for this exercise? Uh, the other thing I would say, and you know, there again, whether you have a DR tool or not, it's really to turbocharge your overall digital footprint, right? Turbocharge your digital footprint, uh, think through your remote selling capabilities, and then kind of think through all of these statements or questions and decide what the right answer is for your your dealership in your in your marketing area. So the first is, you know, expand your purchase options, whatever that means, like whatever that means for you. And in some cases, maybe that means getting a digital retailing tool. And in some cases, maybe that means offering to your salespeople to allow them to negotiate price over phone and email, right? Maybe that's a combination of tools that allows somebody to buy a vehicle remotely. So that isn't really that doesn't really require a digital retailing tool out of the gate. So just think through what expanding the options again, removing barriers to option. What is the curb cut layer of effect for for your dealership? So think that through. Second, keep your inventory up to date. You already do this, but there's just a heightened sensitivity once you start publishing that inventory uh, online in a way that people are expecting to be able to buy it. Uh, we all know the frustration, right? When you wanna go buy something and you go to check out and you add it to cart and it goes, oh crap, it's not available now, or actually it was never available, the information was just wrong. And so we have never really had to keep our inventory as up to date. Uh, as consumers now, as we will now, like as we will now relative to consumer expectation, relative to other digital businesses. So more focus on, on the currency of your inventory and the accuracy of your inventory and pricing data. Uh, offer pickup and delivery. And so this was uh, a movement that was already happening definitely on the luxury side. And you probably have figured out this to a degree by now. But uh, if again, the hardest parts of e-commerce or not the website and really around logistics, figuring out how to organize and deliver a vehicle uh, and complete a sale in the shortest amount of time is probably a good, a good exercise, right? Probably a healthy exercise. Uh, allow remote payments uh, for down payments and, and other charges. So again, whether that means you're doing that through uh, a DR tool that allows you to accept a deposit, or whether you just have some other payment solution that might already connect to your DMS to allow a person to make a down payment on a phone or you know leverage something that already connects to your existing payment terminal that is available through your local bank. 100 ways to solve this problem, but just allowing people to pay in it, you know, remotely for that down payment, and then probably just efficiently going forward for your service business to allow people to pay before they show up. Uh, probably just a good operational change and probably just a good idea. Admitting someone. Uh, simplify your overall web experience. If I were gonna take the last 20 years of Google experience working with other e-commerce retailers and omni-channel retailers, uh, all of that distills down into this sentence, which is simplify your web experience, limit the number of pop-ups, uh, reduce the number of homepage sliders and images on all pages to optimize every page for speed. Optimize every page for a load time of around three or four seconds or less. And that is like, that is literally like 20 years of experience with e-commerce distilled into one sentence. And then we all went and built one of those pages back last March that said, oh, this is what we're doing to make sure you're safe, right? This is how we're keeping you safe. These are COVID measures. So every OEM made pretty much every dealer in the country build that page on their website. And then we stop sharing it with people. So I would say highlight both your safety measures and your, you know, expanded purchase options um, in every media that is available to you, right? So in, you know, maybe that's a, in a an extension in your search ad, maybe that's a call out in a display creative, maybe that's, you know, specific creative in social um, and posts on Google My Business, just get it everywhere. Because I think it's still a going concern and until we've all been vaccinated, people are gonna wanna know that you're keeping them safe. Cool.
Uh, this quote, you know, kindly shared with me from uh, our, our friends at Moto Insight, uh, this this dealer, Honda Surrey, uh, digital retailing has removed roadblocks, right? It's removed, it's, it's curb cut effect again, removing barriers to purchase of traditional transacting. In the same month, we sold two used cars, two customers in Ottawa and Winnipeg, respectively. It's just one of the ways our digital experience has elevated our dealership, right? So what is the tool? What are the tools that will allow you to sell more vehicles, both online and in the showroom and generate more money for yourself and for the OEM. Uh, another slide that uh, I've not shared enough, but uh, I guess I was sitting on it. I didn't mean to be, I wasn't hiding it, but uh, expectations for online car purchase. What did, what are people looking for again from our research from last year? And fundamentally transparency is key. Uh, people are looking for, you know, clarity on price and financing and expecting that to be easy to manage. They're looking for options to compare different vehicle options, which you probably already have. Um, information regarding production and delivery, right? So if we are um, making inventory available that isn't actually on the lot, when will I get it? If it is on the lot, how quickly can I, can you get it to me? What, uh, what customer service tools are you leveraging? So excellent customer care and service. Uh, website should be well-designed and clear and fast. Uh, reiterating all that experience with previous e-commerce clients and uh, offer some sort of post-purchase experience. What is your after-sales experience digitally? Cool. Uh, and if you missed this, uh, in the middle of last year, I wrote an article, it's on Think with Google, uh, with our sector lead, Claudia, uh, talked about a lot of the data we we mentioned here today, but also some other data points and some other, other perspectives. So quick read, if you're bored in the middle of the night and you've watched everything on Netflix and YouTube, then maybe, maybe you want to read this article. Uh, can this one negative review be removed from my Google My Business profile? Asks every dealer eventually. This used to say, uh, ask every dealer I've ever had pints with, and now I'm not having pints with any dealer. So every dealer eventually asks this question. And the short answer is no. The long answer is probably no, probably not. Uh, and I use this example from LaGuardia. All of the time, I was in New York a year and a half ago, and I was at LaGuardia when I first built the first iteration of this slide. Uh, took the screen grab of the Google My Business profile for LaGuardia and their rating of 2.7. So, if you, when we can fly places again, and if you are going to Manhattan, maybe you don't want to fly to LaGuardia. Uh, it's still a mess. It's still under construction. But uh, negative reviews are valuable, right? They're they're actually an important part of the ecosystem. They help. Uh, build credibility. If this was five out of five, then I wouldn't believe it, right? If it's perfect, it's almost, it's too good. Uh, and in this case, this is a good indication. I shouldn't go to LaGuardia. Maybe I should go to, to Newark or JFK or another airport, right? So it helps you decide on where you're going to go. And so that's, it adds credibility and it's, it's useful information for the consumer. But we do have clear guidelines, relatively clear guidelines that indicate when we will remove a review. And fundamentally, it's around if somebody says something absolutely atrocious, like if somebody says something just like horrible about your business or about people in your business, uh, especially if it's a personal attack, uh, those are reviews we will, we will remove. Uh, if somebody discloses personal information about themselves or other people, then those are reviews we will, we will likely remove. So if you want to get a review removed, flag them. Like the first line of defense for this exercise is to flag the review. I would flag it from within your profile and outside of your profile. Um, and then as it says here in the guidelines, again, straight from Google, Google support, uh, just be patient because it can take several days for our GMB support team to review reviews that have been flagged. I saw someone put up a hand. Was that an intentional put up of a hand? Is there a question there? I think it was Todd. Is that a question? Also, the doorbell is going off in the background, and I'm just going to ignore them, just so you know. Uh, but the pandemic created an interesting climate last year. We all closed and went home last March, and uh, and then we scrambled, and we're like, oh, crap, did we tell anyone we were closed? Did we remember that uh, we should we should update our Google My Business profile? And many people, many people did not. And so 
What I would say is it's very important to spend a little time in here. The profiles that are up to date, that are complete, uh, they get more business. They get more interaction. This attracts more people to your actual dealership, and that leads more people to actually purchase from you. Uh, we have, I mentioned this earlier, uh, there's this capability within Google My Business, not everyone uses it, uses it, called Posts. It is probably the best free placement that Google offers that allows you to take your offers and make them available right on your profile, right in Google search. It takes up a lot of real estate uh, in, our, in mobile, and it's quite visible on desktop as well. And that's what people are looking for. People are looking for what are the offers and discounts that are going on in any business. So publish that using, using posts. Also, I've made available here some some key support resources for you. If you didn't find these or know these existed already, uh, there is a automotive specific support area, like a dealer specific support area that I'm providing the link to here. There's also very specific dealership related articles in there around like what to do if you have to say you just bought, you're an auto group and you bought a new dealership and you want to transfer ownership of the GMB profile, how do you go about doing that? As well as the infamous, how do you split your parts, service, and sales hours by creating multiple listings? So both all of those things are covered in that section, as well as this publicly available GMB support form. So there's two versions of this. Uh, this is the one that has been built that is specific for automotive and dealers. Uh, there's kind of something funny on this page that makes me laugh every time I read it. But the, in the smaller print here under GMB support request form, it says, this support request form is to be used exclusively by merchants in the auto industry. And so I didn't, I bet you didn't know you were a merchant in the automotive industry, but you are. Uh, if you're not in the auto industry, then you can access support here. And there's another form. Both work, but this one has a few options that are more dealership specific, so it's it's probably a better choice between the two. And admitting. And, uh, also new, uh, you may have seen, this was all over the SEO blogs and many, uh, or organic and SEO management as well as reputation management organizations uh, across North America commented and published on this in the week it got published. I got a lot of emails, but this is not available in Canada yet, but it is another pilot, another experiment in search that's going on in the US uh, with a handful of dealers and a handful of advertisers uh, and agencies something we are calling cars for sale. Uh, we have other things we call cars for sale because we love redundancy at Google, but uh, this is another feed-based solution that allows you to systematically take a feed of your inventory, new and or use, and publish it straight into Google My Business for free. Uh, it replaces the products area. So it takes the products area that is currently on Google My Business, creates a new area called cars, and we tried to tell them that it's all SUVs and trucks, but no one listened. Um, but it's called Cars, and then it lists all of your available inventory down to the VIN level right there in Google My Business. Tracking this very closely, and rest assured, as soon as this is available uh, in Canada, I will get the word out. I will speak about it from every rooftop that I can. Cool. Uh, should I have a YouTube channel? Asks a dealer who has children who watch a lot of YouTube which probably many of us do. I know my son splits his time. He's a little older, 12 years old, splits his time between Netflix and YouTube. But uh, uh, this, I, I built this slide over a year ago and I only used it like twice. And so I've added it back because I thought it was entertaining. But eight out of 10, it's hard to really wrap your head around how big YouTube is now. Uh, so I just use this as an illustration. And I used this last year for the first time in two presentations in Calgary and Edmonton at Dealer Huddle. And so some of you have seen this before. But um, eight of the top 10 videos from a viewed viewership perspective on YouTube uh, are our music videos, right? So it's, it's funny, and it's hard to wrap your head around. But and it's nine, if you include Baby Shark. If you don't know what Baby Shark is, I would heavily encourage you to never seek it out because it is an earworm like no other song ever in human history. It gets stuck in your head and it will never leave your head. Um, and so last year when I built this slide, uh, Despacito was number one with 6.6 .6 billion views, but that's changed. The pandemic changed everything. And so the number one video now on YouTube in history is in fact Baby Shark at 
7.9 billion, nearly eight. Um, I, this was, I took the screen grab like a couple of weeks ago now. So I bet it's at 8 billion views. And this is really a testament to how people are using YouTube to entertain their children during lockdown. But uh, I can't even wrap my head around what 8 billion views means. Like, I don't even know how big that is. Uh, the This data, I love this data, super interesting from Samsung. So Samsung in 2019, uh, disclosed uh, that they had uh, an install base of 3 million smart TVs in Canada. And uh, when you compare that, say, to Numeris, Numeris is the governing body that all of the television broadcasters get broadcasters use to determine ratings, like, and not even like commercial ratings, but show ratings. So you don't actually know if the commercial was seen at all. But uh, and that's only a few thousand people. That's a few thousand while Samsung had a panel of, basically has a panel of 3 million plus Canadians in 2019. And on their devices, much like Google or Apple on a mobile device can tell like, what apps are you using? They can see, Samsung can tell what apps people are using on their TVs. And so they said uh, back then, two years ago, 42% of folk were streaming only in 19 percent were a combination of light streaming and, or sorry, of streaming and light linear, like light traditional TV, making up an audience of more than 60% of Canadians who are really only accessible through connected TV, like really only accessible through, through digital means. Uh, the other buckets, you've got another 19% that's medium linear and another 19% that is heavier, heavy linear. Uh, and that heavy linear bucket over indexes uh, in Quebec and other French language portions of the country because that's the only place they can find that you know very specific French language content. So um, the the TV ecosystem is now permanently changed, uh, whether the TV broadcasters want to admit to that or not. Uh, our own platform again has grown, and the largest growing surface and platform for YouTube uh, over the last number of years has been the television. And so now our reach is the highest among any video platform in the country at plus 94% on the low end. Uh, it's actually higher in some other demographic profiles. So up to 89% uh, for my demographic, actually. Um, watch time has grown on televisions 70% year over year of YouTube, and that we now see 10 million Canadians every month watching YouTube on their television, which just dwarfs traditional linear television. Uh, and why do we care? Well, outside of it being a useful platform to advertise and get your message out on, uh, it's now also become a very critical part of the buying journey, that 72% of those who watched an online video during the buying journey went and did one of these other lower funnel actions. They went to visit a dealer website. They used like a build-in price tool. They went to locate a dealer. They went to schedule a test drive requested a price quote, or went to research more financing and lease offers. So uh, this number we're now getting in striking distance where YouTube is pretty much as important as search in terms of its place in the buying journey and in terms of the types of actions people take after they actually experience it. Brantford Kia, uh, some of you may be sick of me talking about Brantford Kia, but I'm not going to stop, uh, is one of the best dealer channels uh, in the world, not just in Canada. There are many other channels that have a higher subscriber rate, and this screenshot is a little old. They now have over 12,000 subscribers, um, but they're just really good at this. And But they, they also, if you were to actually talk to them, if you were to call up Brantford Kia and go, hey guys, you're doing a great job on YouTube, what are you doing? And they would just tell you, we're just, we're just doing it, where they produce content all the time and they upload regularly. They found this guy, Peter, Peter from Brantford Kia, who is the face of almost all of their content. Uh, they did not break the bank on any camera gear. They've maybe spent two grand over the last five years. And that was, you know, they shot, they still shoot the majority of their content on a phone. And then they bought a, another camera and a microphone and, and a handheld gimbal just like a fancy selfie stick. Um, and they're just super authentic. Like Peter just answers the questions that people ask him. He does a lot of walk arounds. Um, and in the height of the pandemic last year, they cleared out their tire storage bay and they, they like washed the walls a little and they turned that into a live streaming studio and they live streamed from the dealership 
when people couldn't come in and they just took questions in real time over those live streams. And they were able to do that because they had a subscriber count of over 10,000. And then they just test all the time and they don't always get it right. And it's funny to watch because you'll see where they like create a really mediocre video and then apologize for it in the next video and explain what they learned. So if you want to build out your YouTube channel, just go watch what Branford Kia is doing and do what they do. That is probably the best. Uh, one of the best pieces of guidance that any YouTube creator can give to another YouTube creator, whether it's in automotive or otherwise, is just look at what other creators are doing and do that. Just copy that. Uh, a case study, uh, pretty new, pretty hot off the virtual press uh, from Paragon Honda, uh, Brian Benstock's store. Brian Benstock is a very well-known Honda dealer in the U.S. that he worked with our our internal team that we call the Unskippable Labs team. Uh, Unskippable Labs has a singular mission to build videos uh, with brands that people won't skip, that they want to watch. And so uh, they had a they had a supposition. They had kind of this thesis that they put together for a tier three auto retail related video or videos. And then they they worked with Brian and his team to build those videos. And then they they tested them in the field and pulled back some other data. And this is this is what they did. So they created these four videos. So the first video is like a straight up branding video. It's animation. There's no people in it. There's a voiceover, but it's just, you know, something you might create in iMovie or in Animoto or any online tool. So it's pretty simple um, video just talking about the dealership and buying there. Second video, and that it was 15 seconds. Second video, 15 seconds. Um, Safety video, talking about the safety features uh, of the CRV. Half of the video was stock video footage from the OEM, and the other half of the video was footage they filmed on an iPhone. We asked them why they didn't use an Android, and there wasn't a good answer. And so hopefully somebody does the same experiment on an Android phone just to prove that that didn't make a difference. Uh, the third video, also 15 seconds long, uh, was features. They talked about features and they had uh, talent with talent in it, with a person in it. Uh, her name is Sonia. So Sonia for 15 seconds uh, talks about the features of the CRV. And then the last video, the fourth video here in the corner, Sonia again talking about features for four minutes and 13 seconds. And so again, three of these videos, the raw footage for three of them shot on an iPhone and, and effectively in a storage bay as well. So I think Brian's storage bay is bigger, but basically in a storage bay on an iPhone with Sonia from their dealership. Uh, the punchline on the results here, at least on the cost side of things, um, and the, no one expected this, like Paragon wouldn't, like Brian, I was talking to Brian a little while ago, uh, in a meeting with the U.S. team, and he was surprised, as was our Unskippable Labs team. They wouldn't have predicted this. But the, and really the goal of this campaign was to try and get people from YouTube over into the website. So it was kind of how much video do you need to run to get someone over to the website? And so the cost per site visit for the 15 second ads on average was like four bucks and 41 cents. And the cost per site visit for the four minute video, a buck 71. So ultimately the long format stuffed with features drove three times the site traffic at nearly one third the cost. So if you're wondering like what, what lengths are the right lengths, if you're gonna create a feature video, then longer is probably better. Uh, but it wasn't just features, it was also the length, it was the steady pulse of the video, so they did a lot of fast cuts, they covered a lot of ground, talked about a lot of features uh, throughout the course of this video. Uh, this video then, it garnered more time per feature, obviously, than the short form, because the short form just didn't have as much time. But there was six times more watch time per unique user, so 78 seconds on average. So that was the, the average was 78 seconds. 18% of people actually watched this four minute ad to completion, like to the end. They watched all four minutes and 13 seconds of it, which is just staggering. Uh, and then they also ran a survey 
outside of the video campaign uh, to get a sense of what people thought about the video. And so when they compared the short form to the long form, the long form really came across more informative and educational and more sincere and warm. They, when they ran this campaign, and because they were able to run a much larger campaign, because Brian in the U.S. has a very large marketing area, uh, he was actually able to do something that most dealers cannot do. Uh, he generated brand lift results. Uh, so, and what we learned from this campaign is that there was the safety video, although it didn't do great on the cost per site visit equation, it did increase the awareness of Honda uh, for folk who are kind of interested in cars, so people in our affinity audiences, 12%. So this video, although you know not great on the cost per site visit side, was very effective at building brand awareness. And the this video, the four minute video, actually drove a 6% increase in consideration for Honda. It's pretty impressive, pretty staggering for those in market for a new car. And uh, love, Love this data. So the long format also lifted Honda in Brian's marketing area uh, in search. So there was a 26% search lift among the people who saw this video and then turned to Google search. There's a lot of play between video and search. So people saw the video and then they jumped right over to Google and they went, you know, Honda CRV. Very cool. 26% lift in search. Uh, in case you missed it, we did drop this change in the market and no one talks about it. Um, I, you know, a lot of people have shied away from search partners uh, in the past, but uh, search partners is a great way to extend the reach of search, especially if you're in a smaller marketing area and are kind of hitting the high end of the available queries and impressions in your marketing area. You can expand that by adding in search partners. And so who's in search partners? It's people like Glassdoor and WikiHow and Skyscanner, but new to search partners. And I'm going to, if I ever find the people who like omitted this in the first place in Mountain View, I might slap them. But um, we added YouTube to search partners. YouTube being the second largest search engine on the planet, it seems like an obvious ad, but, and I, so I don't know why it wasn't there previously, but it's there now. So you can now tap into search inventory on YouTube by extending your existing Google search campaigns to include search partners. Uh, also, uh, you know, this format uh, we did talk about pretty extensively last year. It had a different name, though. It was previously called TrueView for Action, which is probably one of the worst names of any Google product we are named. But TrueView for Action is now Video Action Campaigns, a much better name, or VAC, because we love acronyms. Um, and this is how a better way, it wasn't available for Brian uh, in his campaign and in his test. This is a better way for you to generate traffic to your website uh, and or generate leads. So uh, if you want to run video and then create a call to action to have people get over to your web experience, uh, or if you want to use this lead form option that uh, takes a bit more time to, to configure and you can get these leads kind of either by downloading them out of Google Ads or by connecting your CRM using a piece of technology called a webhook, uh, you can now generate leads out of YouTube or just drive more more website visits. Uh, if you want to do this, again, talk to your marketing team and then reach out to the fine folk at, at, at Traffic to do that. Cool. Come on. Uh, what's going on with electric vehicles? Asks a dealer with new EVs to sell. And it's like, how do I sell these electric vehicles? Well, you probably sell them the way you sell the other cars, but that's a different story. Uh, what is going on? Well, people still are hesitant uh, to buy an EV. Uh, there's still barriers to buying them related to price and concerns around charging, right? So people are still holding back or resistant to buying an electric vehicle because they are still either are or perceived to be more expensive uh, and or limited availability to, to charging. Uh, when you narrow in on what would change that, uh, it's really education, right? So if we, as we educate people and as they, or as they educate themselves, um, these things are, are decreased. So the range anxiety concerns, maintenance concerns, cost of running an electric vehicle, all narrow the closer you are to adopting this technology. So the more you know, the more likely you are to ultimately buy. An electric vehicle. Uh, the other data here I would point out, and this data, this came from a survey from AAA in the US. I don't always like to use US data. In this case, I don't mind because I'm pretty sure that, you know, the Canadian 
electric vehicle owners and the U.S. electric vehicle owners are very similar sorts of people. And so it's probably pretty representative of the same kind of folk that bought electric vehicles in Canada. They published the survey just at the end of February last year, so not a lot of people saw this data. Super interesting results, though. Uh, from all of the buyers, uh, from our owners in CA or in a, AAA, in AAA in the US, uh, they said the 96% of them would buy or lease another electric vehicle the next time they were in market for a new vehicle. So that really means once you get into this electrification ecosystem, once I buy my first electric vehicle, I'm staying there. Uh, I am not likely to go back. Two in five owners said they drive more now than they did when they had a gas-powered vehicle. And three quarters have a gas-powered vehicle as well. Right? Their second vehicle is uh, an internal combustion engine, but they do the majority of their driving in their electric vehicle. They prefer their electric vehicle. On average, electric vehicle owners do 75%, three quarters of their charging at home, answering that, where am I gonna charge this? So most people, charging at home, and the vast majority of electric vehicle owners, 95%, have never run out of charge. And I'm willing to bet the 5% of people who run out of charge are kind of probably the same people who run out of gas. They're just probably not good at planning. Uh, how do I get the dealer guidebook? So ask a dealer holding a print copy of the dealer guidebook 1.0, and uh, the answer to that is just ask. So I have in this deck a set of resources. I update this every few weeks with new things. Um, my US friends just published an update to the dealer guidebook. Uh, so it's now dealer guidebook 2.5. Uh, I don't have a Canadian version of that, but the US one is still, it's still pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna get a Canadian version in a few weeks. Uh, my marketing folk are, are working on doing that for me, but um, that's gonna take a little bit of time to turn around. So in the interim, I'm relying on the US version. Bunch of other resources here, some stuff on Google My Business, that self-serve form I mentioned earlier, education stuff uh, from our skill shops. So if you ever wanted to learn more about Google Ads or Google Analytics, you can, you can learn right there. A great video from a YouTube creator called uh, Shelby Church. Uh, she goes into great detail to explain some of the ways she simplifies managing her YouTube channel and creating videos. And she it's what YouTubers don't tell you about starting a YouTube channel, um, which I, I watched and found very informative myself. And so if I ever start a channel, I'm probably gonna do some of the things she recommends. Uh, a guide on YouTube for dealers, uh, more detail on optimization score, a couple of things with Google articles, uh, a more detail on the whole new, new car buyer, as well as, how do you set up your GA4 properties? So we have a new version of Google Analytics. It's being referred to as GA4. And so uh, the, here are the guidelines on how you would go about setting that up, whether you do that or your website provider does that, or if you get the fine folk at, at traffic to do that for you. Uh, one final thought, this is my Jerry Springer, my Jerry Springer final thought of the day, is really we need to accelerate the digital transformation of dealerships. We need to figure out how to layer that curb cut effect into our stores, make it easier to shop. Uh, we, need to sh we need to show up where the shoppers are, fish where the fish are. So leveraging some of the capabilities we talked about today to do that. We need to promote the inventory, right? So if the key decision point for the consumer around what dealership to buy, uh, or buy from is inventory and price, then publishing that information in more places probably a good idea. Uh, we need to automate everything that we can automate to make it easier for ourselves and get more out of what we are doing in our marketing efforts. And then we need to anchor all of that in metrics to understand overall performance. And so that's my Jerry Springer final thought. Over to you, Charles. Matthew, thank you so much for those insights. Uh, a lot of stuff a lot of valuable stuff. One thing that resonates with me and, and my role, again, if you don't know what I do with the Trader family, I manage growth and development and dealer services, is that I coach dealers across Canada, whatever you're independent or OEM uh, or a group, on three pivots, which are very essential. If you want to really put on turbo all the great insights that Matthew just shared with you, you have to revisit three processes inside your dealership. Merchandising, new use, photo descriptive price. Is it A1, 
Secondly, you really need to dive in into your dealership and make sure that you visit how you answer the telephone. How do you answer an email? Is it just text so you have a link and photos? And thirdly, when uh, you're not in the red right now with that COVID thing, you need to make sure that you create a wow effect for a walk-in. And the last process is central. Do you have great digital content? And to Matthew's point, video drives that. Do you have a video that says, at ABC Auto, this is the kind of experience I'm gonna give you when you're gonna purchase your next vehicle. Create a wow effect and talk about that COVID thing where you, you are distancing yourself and still giving great service. And talking about service, do you have a service video that says, why should I take my car to your place? If you don't have those, I'm telling you, those process has at the heart of everything that you do. So please revisit that. That's my two cents, Matthew. That's my transition. Our next guest is Ivan Sandoval. He's a great colleague of mine with traffic. Uh, Ivan has got a lot of experience in automotive digital marketer. He was a top 40, under 40 in 2015. He's a young kid <laughs> with a lot of drive. All right. He has spent considerable time working with the three automotive tier OEM and dealership side. So very passionate. So without further ado, Ivan, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, everybody, for staying on. We have a really good couple of segments here at the end, it's, and, and one especially uh, uh, this one coming up, which basically talks about how you can save on your ad spend. Very important to uh, kind of digest this uh, next couple of slides that I have here because machine learning SEM uh, really reduces the costs of your um, your advertising costs at your dealership. I was a digital marketing manager for about four years, and you know one of the items that I always thought about, uh, and and the DP, and we always talked about was how to save money, how to make your advertising more efficient. Of course, with digital, it can definitely be more efficient, uh, but there is ways to make it more efficient um, now. So we'll go to the next slide. So Google's been pushing agencies to adopt automation and machine learning for some time now. Uh, it's, and it's simple as to why. It's to encourage more efficient advertising. By allowing automation software to maximize your bids, learn your campaigns, and syndicate your ads via your vehicle feeds, that's key, you're able to be seen on more searches, right? more impressions, you're going to have higher relevancy, and you end up paying less cost per clicks. Very important. And this is what this segment is really about. It's about saving you money. This slide here is just a quick indication, quickly demonstrates this one's from Performance Insider Series, a great Google event, talking about how machine learning and automation can increase performance by 20% right off the manual agencies. There's tons of them out there. Uh, of course, you can't simply have automation working on your own. You need some human input too. So that's where the team, the strategist team must be very advanced. This increases performance an additional 15%. At Traffic, we call this humanation Automation and humanation. This combination gives you 35% more performance and in that is ultimately what results in lower CPC. More clicks, better converting clicks and set spend savings. And I'll show you why in the next few slides. So we'll go to the next um, slide. So how do you know you have a machine learning or automated agency? How do you know that? Well, you look at your change history report. This is very key. I encourage everyone to ask your agency for a change history report. You can see I have some action items there talking about uh, asking for a change history report because that's going to show you uh, how many changes were done in your Google Ads account in a given time period, always take a month or something like that. And the difference is going to be staggering. It's either going to be none, <laughs> believe it or not, um, or it's going to be in the dozens per month for a decent agency, or it's in the hundreds of thousands per month for an automated one. So I liken it to a human playing chess with a computer, whereas we're playing a computer versus a computer. More strategy, more moves. You can actually see the, um, the automation on that graph. You see that straight line there? Basically, it's machine learning, figuring out you know, exactly the parameters, changing bids, creating new ads for your new vehicles, uh, optimizing ad copy, changing prices, actively negative keywording, day parting, et cetera. Once it learns, uh, once it figures out like all the parameters for ultimate performance, it kicks into high gear. And you can see on about the 10th day, it kicks into high gear. Your impressions are gonna skyrocket. 
large and your clicks are going to increase for the rest of the life of the campaign. So this is actually a setup, an account setup that we had in August that just started. And so as soon as the 10 day mark hits from now moving forward, you're going to see more clicks and more impressions. So we'll go to the next slide. So how do manual campaigns not optimize? A lot of these agencies out there um, have to use manual because they haven't invested into the technology of automation. They have to be more general. So all year and make model campaigns for all pieces of inventory cannot physically be created, right? You're going to get less impressions because you have less campaigns and you're going to pay higher for your clicks. And also, more importantly, you're going to be less relevant to the search query. And that's really the most important part. You know, if I put in, if I'm a buyer and I put in 2021 Ford F-150 in my mobile phone and I get a new Ford for sale ad, it's not really that relevant. And also in terms of keyword relevancy, there is no F-150 in the search ad. And then when I land on the page, the landing page, I'm brought to the new vehicles. There might be 2020s on there, definitely not any F-150s. I got to filter out the F-150s and then filter out to the XLTs or Lariats or whatever I want to purchase. So not a great experience. So on top of paying more, it's, it's not a great experience for a user. So how can automation create a better user experience? We can go next slide. Because the automation portion is able to create ads, right? Scraping websites every 24 hours, creating VIN and SRP specific level ads to the year, you're creating the highest relevancy, right? To the, ser the search query. I input F-150. I get F-150 in the ad copy, I get 2021 in the ad copy, and then when I land on the page, I get 2021 F-150s. So because there's ads created for every single VIN and every single SRP, I have the most impressions and the best user experience. I'm right on my F-150s, don't need to do any more, I have to wait for load times or anything like that. So automation, not only does it create more impressions um, and lower costs, it's the best user experience. And we'll go next slide. This part here is uh, just kind of the X factor. And it's interesting because I've been growing up in digital quite a while and a, a lot of those old school marketers uh, back in the day had the marketing background, but not necessarily the digital. Um, now, now most marketers have the digital background, but not necessarily the marketing. And I, I know there's lots of great marketers on this call. I saw the list. Um, and, and so I think we're missing a little bit of that. So make sure you're always looking at your ads. These two ads here have the human touch on it, right? We're ensuring the ad copy matches the make in the, in the you know, luxury terms for luxury vehicle. You wanna make sure you are matching your site links to the ad purpose, sale site links for sale ads, service site links for service ads, right? A lot of manual agencies will mix those up. Uh, and coming up with unique USPs and taglines, right? Um, highlighting your benefits and things like that. Yeah, how, how long you've been in business. This is the final touch of a well-rounded agency and ultimately better overall marketing for your dealership. And so we'll go next slide. So just to circle back, um, the combination of automation and humanation um, that results in that 35% increase in performance, you can see on this slide here. This is a keyword planner um, and I input a few different keyword searches. Once you put input the keywords, right, and, and a location, you're able to see uh, Google's top of page bid estimates and top of page bid estimates in the high range. So there's, there's two separate numbers. What's interesting is the top of page bid low range is very low, and that's what an automated agency, one that has high optimization score like Matthew talked about, they can expect to pay that. Uh, lax agency or manual agency will expect to pay pay the top of page bid in the high range. And so um, an actionable tip as well is to use the keyword planner to assess the market de demand, right? See how many searches there are for your vehicles. Take advantage of these low demand auctions with high search volume, but always ask your uh, provider, what are we paying for each of these models? Because some of the results will be very surprising to you. Um, I've seen other agencies um, in the $6 range, $5 range, let's say for the 2021 Ford F-150. And you can see, I, I just put traffic's average CBC in the last 30 days being 57 cents. And, I'm, and I'll also um, note that that does not include name brand um, bidding. This is model search only um, because I wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, kind of doing name brand. That's always the easiest way to get low CPC. But uh, then again, you can get that for free. And we'll go next slide. 
So I encourage everybody when you're, when you're assessing your marketing initiatives, when you're at the meetings, look at the performance and not on something trivial such as management fee. Here's a real life example of two dealerships with the same spend but different management fees. One, traffic which is invested in the automation and the other one's a manual agency. Irrespective of the cost of, of management fee, look at the difference in advertising exposure. So the manual agency on top has a lower management fee but their average cost per click on a non-bid on name is $3.74. So they got 535 visits um, for their advertising efforts on that $2,000 spend. Our traffic uh, automated software there you see at the bottom um, got 52 cents uh, average CPC in that account. So we got users, users in totaling 3,846. So 3,300 more users came to the traffic uh, SEM as opposed to the manual one. So an action item for you guys, like when you're looking at analytics and you're with an agency, always look for how many new users you obtain from your marketing campaigns every month, okay? This is a clear indication of really good marketing efforts. You know, even if cost is, is you know, a factor, and it is a factor, you can always reduce your budget by $200 on, a, on an automated agency, and you'll still be up 3,000 more clicks than a manual one. And so we'll go next slide, Matthew. And finally, before we get into web conversion optimization with Connor, I wanted to show you guys some SEM benchmarks from a few of the top vehicles that demonstrate the difference in click costs that you can see. We have these numbers available at traffic for all of your models. So by all means, reach out to me and we can get you the latest monthly report for all of your dealership vehicle inventory, whether new, used. That way you can gauge how much you're paying per model line um, and as well benchmark. If you're not with traffic, you can benchmark with your other agencies. Um, before I end too, we also have a presentation on how to market your digital retailing investment, which is a pretty cool conversation on the East. When we send out these decks and we will send out links to these decks, we'll make sure to include that as well. And from here, I'm gonna go back to Charles uh, because we are going to learn about web conversion optimization with Connor. Thank you, Ivan, for that. You know, three things that really uh, capture my attention when I hear you on that. I'm a dealer. I want to optimize my campaign. So I wanted to make it faster. This is where e-learning machine kicks in. Second of it, I want to reach out the right audience. Am I talking to my people who wants to buy my vehicle? And third, Oh, that, that packs a punch. My return on investment, please, in pure transparency. So thank you for that, Ivan. Connor is our next presenter, a colleague from Traffic. Uh, also, Connor has been with Western Canada as an OSC, which is consultative channel. So he's been in strategy all the time. He really digs it. He loves to learn. And most of all, he loves to get close to dealers, spend time with you on the field, understand what's your business and come up with great digital strategy campaigns to do home runs out there and share some vehicles. So Connor, you have the floor, sir. Just unmute Connor and go for it. That always helps. So th thanks a lot, Charles, and thanks to everyone on the call. For my portion today, I'm going to focus on optimizing for increased internet lead count. So we're gonna look at two different perspectives, one pertaining to your mobile VDP structure, and secondly, we'll look at your Google My Business listings and optimizations that dealerships should be making on a regular basis. So starting with the mobile VDP optimization, I'm going to leverage the concept Think Dealer and push this one out to all participants on the call. So what I want you to do just for 10 or 15 seconds is to analyze the three different dealership mobile VDPs you see on screen and conclude which you think converts the highest for web leads. So just take a quick 10, 15 seconds to scan through the three interfaces. Go for it, everybody. Which one? Okay, so hopefully everyone has come to a conclusion. Um, what is most important here is not the actual answer. We will look at uh, some data-driven analysis on the next slide, but for now, what was important was the critical thinking that you undertook to determine your conclusion. Now, some of you potentially looked to the left website and thought, 
uh, that would convert the best, probably with a thought process that multiple buttons or multiple calls to action should equate with increased leads. But I'm hoping that more of you saw better value in having a cleaner interface like we see in the center and on the right hand side. And from there, it becomes a question of whether you think one strict call to action, such as unlock our best price, would perform better or worse than multiple diverse call to action. So, as I mentioned, we will look at um, we will look at some data driven results on the next slide. But for now, I'm hoping the majority of you chose the center option and saw firstly the clean interface, but secondly, what we would categorize as instant communication methods, options like text us and call us. So it's important now to take a step back and just consider mobile intent versus desktop intent. And to do so, I'm just going to get everyone to do a very quick uh, self-reflection. So if you consider any product or service that you purchased or engaged with even over the past year or several years, and ask yourself, do you recall submitting a form on a mobile device? So I can't hear anyone, but I would imagine the end result would be the same if you weren't on mute. Um, generally, it's going to be zero. So people are reluctant to submit forms on mobile. They're cumbersome, but more importantly, your intent, your expectation, your behavior, regardless of what vertical you're interacting with, it differs from desktop to mobile. So if you have questions on a mobile device from a company, your expectation is you can get real-time answers or close to real-time answers, fulfilled through functions like chat, SMS, and click to call. So it's no different for automotive. The way that you behave, as a consumer for any industry from desktop to mobile is the exact same for an automotive consumer. And that's something that we need to keep in mind when we analyze our website structure from desktop to mobile. So that is basically the recommendation for dealerships to focus on. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Matthew, we're gonna see an example of a dealership VDP that keeps those instant communication methods to the fore. Now, Every single one of you likely has these communication methods on your website. So you will, you'll certainly have a click to call and then you likely have chat integration and you potentially have SMS integration. But the question is, are you aligning your mobile VDPs with the mobile user intent? So what I mean by that is as a user scrolls down a VDP on your website, are they being prompted to take action like chat with us now, ask a question, text us, call us now. That is what a consumer on mobile is going to respond to, not an antiquated long form that may not even embed correctly into the mobile device. So the most important takeaway I would suggest is that a lot of this digital marketing, mobile um, or website UI, user interface, user experience, a lot of it is often common sense. And I feel like dealerships may view it as an alien um, type infrastructure that they're not familiar with websites, they're not trained with websites, but at the end of the day, we're all consumers and the methodologies that we use as consumers apply as, as they do in automotive as they would in any industry. So in a nutshell, I would ask you to review your mobile VDP setup um, with the same level of critical thinking that you hopefully employed a couple of minutes ago. And if you don't have these calls to action at the, you know, to the fore of your, your stack order, add them and measure what the performance impact is on your web leads. Uh, you can see some sample data on screen as well. That's from directly from the traffic advertising and analyzing the impact on cost per lead month over month from a dealership that uh, implemented these structural changes. But the benefit of doing this is not just to improve your advertising performance, it is to accommodate your potential customers on your mobile website as they want to interact with your business. So it doesn't matter if they come from a paid Google ad, they come organically, they come from a referral, direct, this, this implementation will increase your web leads. And, and simply, I took a note from Matthew to try and uh, go full circle, but the curve cut philosophy, remove those major barriers, put yourself in your consumer shoes, analyze your website as a consumer, and make these changes to accommodate the user experience to a better degree. 
So that is the website portion. If we go to the next slide, we're going to look specifically at Google My Business optimizations. So over the past few years, there's been a strong correlation between Google My Business updates and increased local rankings and conversions. So those local actions you'll be familiar with from your Google My Business listing, there can be clicks to your website, there can be direction requests to your store, and there can be phone calls direct to your store. So what might surprise you over the next few slides is literally the ease at which you can optimize Google My Business. So I'm hoping that we can portray that through a few different examples of, of optimizations you can be making. And the question as to why you should prioritize Google My Business as part of your marketing execution. Um, as you'll see on screen, there's data from a dealership whereby I took one month in 2020 and reviewed their performance year over year. So for that dealership in terms of local actions, um, which were a direct result of regular optimizations to their GMB, they saw website increase, website traffic increase of over 100% directly from GMB, direction requests increased by over 40%, and phone calls to the store from their GMB listing increased over 73%. Um, so now we can jump ahead and look at some of these optimizations. So the very first one is reviews, and particularly responding to reviews. Um, so sticking with the, the consumer psychology aspect, um, each new generation brings with it a, a further divide toward brand loyalty. So there is less and less brand loyalty across any vertical, and I'm sure as dealerships you experienced that over the last number of years for automotive. So why is that important? The um, new entrance to market will effectively leverage reviews, third-party reviews, as a determining factor whether or not they want to do business with you. So every dealership effectively should have a strategy for attaining reviews and likewise have a process for responding to reviews. So in terms of responding, positive reviews naturally are, are very easy to respond to. Negative reviews typically uh, throw up an obstacle for dealerships. Who is this person? What are they saying about us? How do we remove it? Uh, how do we call Google? So in effect, what we sh in effect, there's, there's best practices for handling negative reviews. And as much of a cliche as it sounds, a negative review is effectively an opportunity for a brand positive outcome. So in terms of best practice, what I see having the most impact from a dealership stand standpoint is having the general manager or the dealer principal own that review. So directly respond, offer to take it offline, provide a direct sell or a direct email, and offer recourse. That way, in the future, when that review, which will be stagnant, when it's reviewed by potential or prospects, uh, potential customers, they're gonna see that your dealership cares. You understood that there was an issue, you didn't try to hide from it, and you took action. Um, and a side note, leveraging what Charles mentioned about you know, video, the importance of video and why buy. If you have standout reviews on Google and elsewhere, leverage those as part of your why buy. So differentiate from your direct competitors by what your customers say about you. And that can be done through video, that can be done through your marketing, et cetera. Uh, so let's move on to Google Posts as another optimization activity. Again, very straightforward, Google Posts, are effectively free branding on Google. Now, they're not so much a ranking factor, but they're more of a engagement, um, more of an engagement objective. And if done correctly, dealerships can see a low cost lead generator from Google Posts. Now, what specifically should you be posting? That is gonna be subjective to every store, um, whether it's, but, but what I would say is, align it with your goals for the month ahead or the quarter ahead and post anything or and everything that is um, synonymous with those with those objectives. So whether it's retail, branding, uh, different departments, um, education, just ensure that you are availing firstly of this free advertising space and taking it a step further, there is relatively easy implementations you can do to measure performance. Um, hopefully you have someone in the marketing department in your store that can, can handle this, but I do work with GMs that have taken this on themselves. So you can add effectively parameters called UTM parameters, put them on your posts, track how many people are clicking, what their experience is when they come to your website, and over time start to understand um, what type of content is going to get you the best results from this effectively free advertising on Google. Um, 
So we can go on to the third, which is relatively similar, which is products and categories. So one important thing to know about products on your GMB is they generally sit above the fold. So if you are not including products, you're missing out. There's a huge opportunity to have that, again, that advertising space above the fold. Now, products can be used as a, as a retail, um, uh, basically, they can be used as an online catalog for your VINs. So you can have descriptions, you can have prices, you can do similar to what's on screen right now and have uh, links to your um, online shopping tools. Again, the same, the same idea applies for products and categories. Use them firstly, and over time test and figure out what is working best to drive traffic and leads for your store. And similar to the very last slide, there is a, an extensive white spark study that was done, not specific to automotive, but including automotive businesses. And both posts and products uh, were shown to be used by 4% of businesses. And that's in Canada only. So huge, um, huge potential there. And the next and final one is regarding photos. So very, very straightforward but a compelling data study on screen right now from Bright Local, which saw a huge correlation between a high volume of GMB photos and a higher conversion yield. So effectively, every dealership should be regularly adding photos to their Google My Business. And those photos can be interior, exterior shots, staff, community outreach, and of course, inventory. Um, but just make sure that you, are, that you are adding these photos. So I'm hoping, you can see from the Google My Business side just how user-friendly the platform is. Maybe that's not possible to see here, but very user-friendly. But the actual implementations that you could be making every single week to drive up your local rankings, your eye leads, are very, very easy to implement. Uh, so that concludes my portion of the presentation. So I hope you, uh, hope you find some value there, some takeaways that you can implement and uh, measure the impact on your internet leads. Thank you, Connor, for that. It's huge opportunity in Google My Business. I cannot believe 4% only are using this, Connor, right now. So, you know, build it. It's like the fields of dream. You know, build it, they will come. Bring those photos in, bring those prices and those incentives. So without further ado, uh, everybody, I want to open the floor for questions. If you have questions uh, to our uh, people right now online, please just unmute, fire away, or if you want to go and chat with us, uh, do so. We will answer your questions right now. All right, first one on my side. Yes, we will share that uh, video of today webinar. All right, uh, some people also taking uh, screenshot with their mobiles <laughs> live. We will share also, thank you, Matthew, uh, Ivan, and Connor for uh, the PowerPoint. We'll share the PowerPoint so you can have those in front of your eyes, all right? It will be better than a, a fast screenshot with the mobile there. All right, uh, we have a question there, Matthew, in, in the chat. How many agencies use automation? Do you have an idea, Matthew? That feels like a plant, Ivan. That feels like. Um, <laughs> come on, come on, same, right. same last name, maybe. That's why I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know <laughs> the answer to that question. Um, not all of them is maybe the only way I can answer that. Uh, I don't. I don't think we have a clear picture of, um, you know. And there's really two axes, right? There is the, do they use any automation? Do they use automation extensively? Or you can, do you have to, if they're using Google Ads, they're probably using some level of automation, whether they are intending to do that or not. But it's also, you know, it's, it's also more the difference between are they updating things or not, right? It's kind of the, I once fired an agency, once I took over for, um, a, a, a media business in, in one of my jobs uh, because I could see that the agency that had been running the account for the last 12 months had never signed in. Yeah. Had, oh. hadn't, okay. signed, hadn't signed in for many months, hadn't signed into Google Analytics. And so, you know, about a, a day after I took over that media role, I fired that agency. So um, that's, yeah. a per, that's a sample size of one, though. That's a story. That's not a Google feature. That's a mapping feature. So, all right. Thanks for that. So another question coming in. Any suggestion uh, for all base platform to be used for dealerships for ad optimization on Google Ads? Yeah, traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here, here comes the guy no, from traffic. No, no. Yeah. 
little bias, but uh, yeah, traffic is uh, obviously that's our our main strength is to automate ads, and yep. um, you know, it, especially too, it's automating the uh, the actual ads. So exactly automating the vehicles and automating your inventory because mm -hmm. you change prices every day. Um, you sell cars every day. You 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 stock in cars every day. An agency that's not automated in that sense won't be able to keep up. You know, they might use automated bids and things like that, um, and then that's what they might tell you. But you know, it's really that portion of it that's the most important because you're always up to date. Your prices are always up to date. Um, again, better user experience for in in that respect. Um, there's also Dealer Breacher is a, a self-managed platform um, that also does the same thing. So Use, it uses software, you input your, what kind of weighted inventory you wanna focus on, let's say used your 2020s and back like demos, um, it'll be able to concentrate on that. So that that's another one as well, Dealer Breacher is a self-managed platform. So thank you, Ivan, for that. So again, speed, uh, e-learning machine at your service so you can have a great return on investment. And what gets me all the time, gentlemen, is that it's the right audience. You have to be focused on the audience and deliver your car exactly to the car shoppers. All right, Amanda is asking, Matthew, one of your slides talked about both new and used buyers contact stores, 73% and 63% uh, were recorded as walk-ins. Um, was this pre-COVID stats? Uh, if so, have you guys seen how COVID has changed these stats? Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, so it was uh, actually, and so th the data that was collected was collected just after we came out of lockdown in wave one. So it was sort of, although it wasn't pre-COVID, it was under circumstances when people could get out and go to dealership. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and we don't have a great update on that specific question or that specific uh, data point, however, uh, speaking with a lot of the call tracking providers, because I have been pursuing this kind of more elaborate call conversion project uh, with a handful of folk, uh, the one thing, a piece of data that was shared with me recently from the folk at Call Review is that in lockdown conditions or since COVID, the, the flip or the rate uh, of calls to leads has, has shifted very dramatically four to one, that for every single lead you get, you probably get four sales calls. So there is actually a study on that. I can try and track it down. Um, but it it seems like, and it goes without saying, if you were just looking at that slide, if I can't walk in, and the second most popular way for people to interact with the dealership is is over the phone, whether that's by calling or by by SMS, yeah. then it is it is going to be the phone that is going to be the the next most important and probably the most important tool that we've had at our disposal all along that we've kind of forgotten right or have kind of ignored yeah solid point and again uh, everybody all dealers listening group dealers revisit your process or how you answer your phone email i see emails of replies when i test Still, uh, just a couple of phrases, no photos, no link, no video link that says, why buy at my dealer? Put some meat on the bone there, revisit that. So uh, thanks for that, Matthew. Do we have questions again? Last round. So, ooh, All right. Two. Yeah, we, um, yes, we have one. Well, second step to assess and compare on car shopper's journey. You mentioned that 92% want to get information quickly. What time is, what does quickly mean? Within days, hours, or minutes? Uh, any stats on this that change the conversion or conversation? Conversion. Um, so, yeah, so we didn't actually have that in the 2020 study. We did have it in 2019 and in previous years. And what we've seen kind of, and again, it's because, you know, we, we can't, sometimes we change the survey and we ask different questions. We felt like we'd beat that one to death uh, over previous years because we've been mm -hmm. doing the, the research for 15 years. And the, right. the answer for a number of years was within an hour, right? The, the answer for the majority of people is that if I call you, I want you to call me back right away. If you email me, or if I email or text you, I am expecting a response within an hour. Probably faster on text, it's probably closer to the email number. Um, depending on when they reach out though, it, it may be different. So if I email you at two in the morning, I'm not expecting you to email me back by three. But uh, 
Well, and I think it's the reality of, you know, any, any vehicle shopper, if I am a person and I'm like, I really need a new SUV and I wake up in the middle of the night because that's what's keeping me up, I might send that email at two or three in the morning. No one's expecting a response till later that morning. But the, the answer to that question was in a perfect world within an hour. Yeah, just to add that, add to that, when I was at Ford um, as in the D3 program, um, our timeline was 15 minutes. So yeah, yep. it varies, but depends on where you are. But that's what was Ford of Canada's uh, kind of timeline. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was depends. It depends on your process and your team and the way you have your templates ready to fire in your emails, uh, that will make. And to your point, Matthew, uh, if I send it in the middle of the night and as a dealer or a group, I have an automation system which is well done with a great logo, with uh, all the trimmings in there, it will be a note to a reply that right at night, be, be aware that somebody is going to reach out. They like that a lot. And sometimes we forget about that. Yeah. Another question now, Lowell, how confident can I be uh, when using store visit in Google ads as a KPI? Is that level of certainty changing over time or is this the same since I originally launched? So is it the same? Hey, Lowell, how's it going? Um, yeah, it's it has changed. It's improved. So the and and the latest latest data latest latest data point I have on store visits uh, was pre pandemic, and that was that just around this time last year, uh, we had Google had across all of the businesses that were able to surface call or sorry uh, store visit conversions, we had recorded over thirty billion store visit conversions. Wow. Uh, just in an, an immense amount of data. And so what that has done, outside of the fact that we changed the the sign of the technical capabilities of that um, feature on a regular basis, and that gets rolled out kind of at six month intervals, uh, it also means the machine learning model that we are using to identify local intent uh, just continues to get stronger, right? So it, 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 since inception, it has just become more and more powerful. The challenge we have uh, as dealers in Canada is that only 20% of dealers, and it goes up and down depending on where we are in states of lockdown, uh, have the data. So only 20% of accounts of Google Ads accounts in Canada for dealers have store visit conversions. And that is really a triple whammy um, result of the combination of, in some cases, our marketing area may be too small. Like we just don't have the number of you know, clicks, impressions, and actual people visiting to actually generate enough data to generate the model for Google to have confidence in the data to actually release it in Google Ads. And then the other two whammies are, are the same, are at any point, uh, if you have the data or have had the data, but then there is a shift on either side uh, in the number of impressions or clicks and or the number of people actually arriving at dealership that will shift the model in a way that the the threshold for our confidence uh, may be exceeded and we may we may stop surfacing the data and so what a lot of advertisers automotive and otherwise have seen over the course of the last year is they're just not getting store visit conversions anymore so if you are lucky enough to have store visit conversion data in your google ads account you can 100% trust it and leverage it as a metric and now bid to it either by applying it uh, to a local campaign or by adding it in the all conversions column as a, a biddable conversion using smart bidding. So you can, you can trust it, you can use it, but it is, it is somewhat rare in automotive. Yeah. Yeah, they qualify themselves. Uh, that's why your digital content is so important. It's all about you, uh, you know, your store, your dealer group, and uh, showcase that. And they will call you, or a, a very small person will be emails. But the telephone these days really rocks. Ivan, any comment on that? You're good. Nope, good. Just thanking everybody for staying on the call. Um, I love when digital marketers get into a nice discussion talking about uh, digital. So thank you, everybody. Um, yep. It was a great conversation for sure.
So thank you, everybody. Again, thank you, uh, Matthew. Thank you, Ivan, Connor. Uh, again, uh, Charles Chamberlain saying to you that we will uh, share that uh, video and PowerPoint to everybody who was uh, on the call today. Again, uh, go for it. Uh, go digital. Optimize your process. If you have any question, reach out to us. Our pleasure to support you. Stay strong and most of all, be safe, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.